For more media content from Grace Community Church in San Antonio, Texas, go to gccsatx.com. Open up your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 19 to start off with. I used to like to take a text and work all my way through it, but there's so much that I want to say today to different persons who are here. I know it is Father's Day, and therefore I want to speak about fathers. And we will, uh, we will admonish fathers, but we will also talk to others about fathers and how they should honor them. Brother Allen mentioned Homer Crane and he died in a, in a nursing home. Uh, last time I went to visit him, he knew it was me for about five minutes and then for about a half an hour didn't know, didn't know it was me. He was completely suffering from, from several, several problems of the mind. Now, he was in that nursing home. He was probably as poor as a person can be physically. Poor economically, he had almost nothing. To most of those people walking around that nursing home, he was nothing but an old, poor, out-of-his-mind man who could no longer even go to the bathroom on his own. I think this is quite amazing. That here's a man who has served Jesus Christ most of the days of his life and served Him in places where few men would have been even brave enough to go. Now, he was hard-headed as he could be. He could sometimes... He literally did. He was John Wayne of South America. I've seen him grab the end of a machine gun that a soldier was holding on him and say, boy, if you're going to shoot me with that gun, you're going to shoot me in the back because that's the last thing you're going to see. I'm going to turn around and witness. You know, he, he was that tough. Now, for the world, he was an old, poor, demented man. And to Christ, he was a prince. Now, I want you to think for a moment about the men that are going to die, even in this room. There will be many men around here who die with great honors. Many, many people attending their funerals. The most exquisite casket the most exquisite funeral, luxury absolutely everywhere. Maybe the mayor of the town comes and shows up and gives his two cents there at the meeting place, all to honor him, and yet he will open up the bowels of hell with his death. It reminds me of an old missionary story that I heard years and years ago about this man who had served overseas all his life in Africa. He had lost his wife there. He had lost his children there. He was now too old to serve. So he's going to take a boat ride back to the States. Well, as he's getting on, he he finds out that the only fare he can afford is to be with the animals. They're carrying livestock back. And so he buys a ticket to ride with the livestock. While he's getting on, a famous, this was back before television and movies, a famous theater actor, happened to also be there. And he got on the side of the boat. They rolled out red carpet. Uh, there were all kinds of dignitaries there to see him off. And the man just thought to himself, Lord, give me strength. Give me grace. So he, he, he makes his way all the way back across the ocean, sleeping with animals. And when he's coming down off of the plank with the rest of the animals, over to the right, he sees this, again, this theater dignitary coming down, they'd rolled out the red carpet, there was a band, there were photographers, all sorts of things, a carriage to whisk him away to the finest hotel. This missionary was given a little prophet's chamber over a storefront. And he sat there and he had some bread, some soup, and right there he broke. And he said, Lord, I've served you all these years, but this I can no longer take. This man has never served you. He's never honored you. He's never sacrificed for you. The only thing he's ever done is thought about himself. And yet he comes home 
they roll out the red carpet, the bands are playing. I lost my wife in your service. I lost my son, my daughter in your service. And I come home with the cattle. And now here I am in this little room where I'll die. How could you give me a homecoming like this? And the Lord spoke to him. Yeah, he still does that. The Lord spoke to him and said, son, you're not home. You're not home. You know, it's not hard to live for Jesus Christ on the mission field. not. Don't ever think it is. Oh, it has its difficulties. I pity you because you have to live here. Are they going to give you a great funeral here, but you have no homecoming there? Are you going to be someone who lives for Christ? What do you live for? Your house? Nice cars so that everybody likes your car. You live around a lot of outlet malls. Is that what you love to do? Shop? Look, look in the mirror at yourself? Toys? Is that what's important to you? Again, like I said last night, God is eternal. His word is eternal. And people are eternal. Albert Schweitzer was a missionary. Now he was one he was he was liberal, and I, I don't even believe that he knew Christ at all. But he puts us to shame. Because this is what he said. He was a concert pianist. He was a medical doctor. He was a brilliant philosopher. I can't really call him a theologian because he was liberal. But he was a brilliant philosopher. He died, spent his life in Africa. And someone asked him, you know, you, you're a concert pianist. You're a, you're a medical doctor. You're a brilliant philosopher. He said, I have decided that I would spend the first 30 years of my life preparing myself so that I could give the next 30 years of my life away. Totally and completely away. He gave a lecture as an old man one time and he looked at a group of seminary students. Again, it was a rather liberal seminary. But what he said was true. He said, I don't know what you students are going to do or what you're going to become, but I can tell you this. The most joyful of you will be those who have given their lives away in servanthood. My first philosophy class in 1979, we were discussing at one time the philosophy, the Roman Greco philosophy, particularly during the Roman Empire. And they had a list of virtues in the Roman Empire. And, and we sat there, this was in 79, a long time ago, and we just, I wasn't a Christian, none of my friends were, the other philosophers weren't, but we sat there and just go, this can't be true. These were their virtues? This, this can't be true. This was their virtues. Pride. Aggressiveness. Materialism. Championship. Winning. And see, we weren't Christians, but we had grown up in a Christian culture. And we had enough of that culture in us to know, how could anybody consider these things a virtue? Guess what? Those are the virtues today in the American culture. And those are a lot of the virtues you teach your own children. 
especially when you tell them on the baseball field, go out there and be proud. Go out there and win at any cost. Stick it to them. You see? And yet here's our meek and lowly Christ who knows that all authority is given unto him and he takes a towel and he binds himself and he washes his disciples' feet. You know, sons, daughters, fathers, mothers, I tell you what our greatest problem, it always comes down to one thing, we are not like Jesus and it's so hard to be like Jesus because we are so filled with the purposes of this world. What the world says is the way we should live. And it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. The only thing that matters is the day you die and you stand before Him. That's all that matters. Well, I got Jesus. I don't have anything to worry about. If that is your attitude, you don't have Jesus. Because the person who has Christ doesn't see Him as a ticket. They follow Him as a person that they love and they want to be like Him. They want to be like Him. Now, rather than just go on off of that, let's look at Leviticus 19. Just a moment. Verse 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. Now, the first thing I want to do today is talk to the children. Now, this is children if you're still in your parents' home, but this is also if, you're, if your parents are still alive and you're 50. It's talking about honor. Men, some of you who are over 60, You knew as a little boy when you walked in the room how you were supposed to act. I was as wild as a a wild buck in high school. But if if an elderly person came in the room, I mean, I was wild. But we knew you honor them. You act a certain way. All the, what you've got to understand, those of you who are my age and older, you've got to understand all the foundations, all of them are now gone in our culture. So that when someone gets saved, you can't assume like 40 years ago that they come out of a Christian culture. Now they've been born again and will really begin to teach them what you've got to realize. If anybody gets saved today, even in most so-called Christian homes, they're nothing but a pagan. They know nothing about Christian virtue because they've been raised on SpongeBob instead of the Apostle Paul. You see, there's just I mean. I heard young men talking the other day and they're fine young men now. They're Christians, but they were telling me something that they did one time. They were athletes, football players, and they were laughing about what they did to this guy. And I, I was in shock. And I went to him. I said, young men, I said, let me let me just share with you something. If someone had done that to me. I would have killed them. As as an unconverted athlete, I would have killed him. And then I would have had to have left town because what they had done to me was so shameful I wouldn't have been able to show my face. And you guys laugh about it. You see, older men, you've got to understand something. Nothing of the virtue was taught now exists except the very opposite. And so when someone comes to Christ, and even in our churches, we can no longer assume that young people understand certain truths. They don't. They're all gone. And so we have to start at the very beginning. And here in this text, it says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, before the gray head. Now, young person, listen to me. That doesn't just mean an old man. It's referring to an elder. And primarily in the context, it'll be an elder who has authority. Now, who has authority? The pastor has authority. Your father has authority. Your mother has authority. What does it mean? You are to honor your father. Honor your father. Not just obey your father. 
If you obey your father with a grumpy look on your face, you have dishonored him and sinned before God. My mother died in her 80s. And no, I was not under her authority any longer. I left that home, started my own family, and became the head of that family. But my mother, even when she was wrong, deserved my honor. Now look what he says here. He says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. But this is the important part. And fear thy God. Young person, listen to me. Your relationship with your father, the way you treat your father, is directly related to your relationship with God. It is. You say, my father is a rascal. My father is this. My father is that. My father is dangerous. My father left me. If your father is dangerous, maybe you had to be pulled away by the state and maybe rightfully so because he was a wicked man. But if you are talking to him through the bars of a prison, you should still honor him. But that's not the case with most of us, is it? Our fathers weren't dangerous men. They were just men. Your dad's here today. Probably aren't dangerous. They're probably not trying to overthrow the government. They're probably not trying to hurt you. They're just men and they're fallible. God calls you to honor them. Honor them. As a matter of fact, one of the greatest ways to enter in To continue in a right relationship with God is through continuing in a right relationship with the authorities He's put over you. Several years ago, many years ago, I started the ministry working with street people in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Ended up living down there with street people. One day, a friend of mine and I, we decided that we'd kind of take a survey. Where did all these people make their first wrong turn? Every one of them, it began with rebellion in the home and rebellion against the authority that God had placed over them and a refusal to honor their father and their mother. Do you notice, if you ever listen to me talk to uh, Brother Allen, I don't call him Carlton. And it's not just because he's a lot older than I am. <laughs> I don't call him Carlton. Why? Because when I was a young man, he was there in Peru. It was Pastor Allen. It was Brother Allen. Don't walk up to a man of God and go, Hey, Bill. It's your pastor. It's your pastor. Show show respect. Folks, I do not agree with many of the policies of our President Obama but I am not going to make jokes about him. I may stand against and say, I don't agree with you, sir, but I'm going to honor the office. I'm going to honor things. Because God has set these things up. He has. He set up our authorities of government. He has set up our parents. He has set up rulers in the church, elders in the church, pastors in the church. There are authorities. Now, if those authorities are wrong... God will deal with them. And if those authorities are wrong, sometimes we must stand up and deal with them. But there is a correct way of doing it. In the home. Listen to me, young person. If your father's doing something illegal or something that's greatly harming you, you need to tell somebody. I'm not talking about being in some abusive relationship, some some perverse relationship horrid thing happening to you. No, you need to go to an authority. But most of us just have problems with our dad because they want us to be home at a certain time. And they want us to take out the trash. And they want us to dress a certain way. And to listen to certain music and not listen to other music. And they want to watch over the friends that we're with. That is their right. It is not only their right... If they don't do it, they are in sin. 
You see, children, before your father, you have rights. You have right to be treated with hu human dignity. You have right according to what scripture dictates of how a child ought to be treated. And as a state will dictate how a child ought to be treated. You have those rights. You have no authority. You have no authority. You want some authority? Grow up, work hard, get a job, start a family. But until that moment, you're under your father. And you are to honor him. A few years ago, I was sitting down kind of at a church about halfway up the aisle on the side there. And this kid who kind of knew me, I was getting ready to preach. He walks by me like this and just grabs me by the ear and flips me on the ear. And I, I just put my head down. I prayed because I knew in that context I may should talk to him but I should not defend myself or become angry that God would deal with him. But another brother in the church saw it. Did not have the same uh, sentiments that I had and almost tore his head off. But the boy needed his head tore off. He had no idea. Now, go for just a moment to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to teach you something, young people, that will help you greatly. Honor your father and mother. Verse 2. Well, let's start at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Why do you obey your parents? Because it's right. And you say, well, you know, how, you know how you are, young person. You want an explanation. Well, what do you mean it's right? It's right. Well, I want an explanation. The Lord's not going to give you one. He says you do it because I said so. Now, parents, I feel like we need to say... You do it. And I think we also need to explain it once. We don't have to explain it over and over. But God doesn't have to explain anything to anybody. Because you know what makes it right? He said it was right. That's what made it right. That's what happens when you're God. And so he says, honor. He says, obey your parents in the Lord in the sphere of the Lord, because of the Lord, because of your relationship with the Lord, do not tell me that you have a relationship with the Lord, young person, and yet, yet you live in rebellion against your parents. Don't do that against your father. Don't do that. It's not true. It's just not true. So he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now look what he does now. He goes above obedience. And he says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You say, oh, I love commandments with promises. We well, need to be very careful because promises always have a counter to them. If God gave this commandment, as the first commandment in the Decalogue, the first commandment in the Ten Commandments that deal with human relationships. Notice this. He doesn't say in the Decalogue, obey the government, even though we should. Now let me ask you a question, young person. You disobey the government, what's going to happen to you? Hammer's going to fall. The hammer is going to fall. But here, God sets the authority of your parents higher than the government. And it is a greater dishonor for you to dishonor your dad than it is for you to dishonor the government. Do you see that? And he doesn't give you a promise if you honor the government. He gives you a promise if you honor your father and your mother. Now listen to me need to have a whole course on what we refer to as the omniscience of God. Metaphorically, sometimes it says that God has a book. Now we know that God doesn't need a book to write things down. He knows them all. Now let me share with you something about God's knowledge. It is exhaustive. That means there is not anything he does not know. 
and it is immediate and without effort. Now, what do I mean by that? This is very important if you're going to understand the omniscience of God. To say it is immediate and without effort is this. He does not have to think or calculate or sit down and say, well, let me just think about that for a moment and come up with an answer. No, he knows every thought, every deed, every word that's ever come out of your mouth and he knows it without even having to check a book or to call it to remembrance. It is always before him. Always. That is why, my dear friend, if the blood of Jesus Christ has not cleansed you, you are in trouble. Because it's not that his sins, he's going to pull them back up. They are always right before him. That is why he is always angry with the wicked. You're outside of Christ. He's angry with you. Why? Your sins, every one of them from the cradle to the present is before him constantly. And not only does he know that, he knows every sin you'll commit. That's why when you snap back at your father. When you try to trick your father, you can trick your father. He's not omniscient. But you can't trick the God of your father. And even if your father hates God, God is still recording your sins against him. Because you're to honor your father. Now, something very important here. Again, this is all things considered normal. For example, I, I don't want a child to think that if, if their father is abusing them or something like that, they're just supposed to obey that. That's not what God says. But in a normal family relationship, I want you to notice two things, one about the husband and the wife and the father and mother and the child. He doesn't tell me to love my wife if she respects me. Because if he did, then I would always have an excuse not to love my wife. Because she never respects me perfectly. And even if she did, I wouldn't recognize it. But also it doesn't say love your or respect your husband if he loves you because that would give her a loophole. She wouldn't have to obey that ever. He just says, look, Paul Washer, you love your wife and I don't care what she does. And if you don't, you'll have to deal with me. Listen, Chato Washer, honor your husband, reverence your husband, submit to your husband. And if you don't, you have a problem with me. It's the same way, child. He looks at you and says, I know more about your father than you do. I know every blemish. Yet I have commanded you to honor and obey your father. And if you do, a promise will come with that. And if you do not, then the counter of that promise will come with that. And what is that promise? A long life that he will grant you. Now, in the Hebrew mentality, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to live for a hundred years. It's speaking more. It's kind of the same way with, the, with eternal life. Even though eternal life lasts forever, that's not the main point of eternal life. The main point of eternal life is the quality of life that you'll have. That's why it begins now. It's a new quality of life. In the same way, listen to me, young person. He's saying, if you honor your father... You honor your mother. You will have a higher quality of life. You know, the entire Christian life can be summed up in two things, according to Second Peter. Life and godliness. Life, real life. This essence of life, this power of life, this life coming out like a fountain in your heart. He says, a long life I will grant thee. I will grant thee. Let me ask you something, young person. Would you describe your relationship with your father in this way? That you reverence him? You know that word reverence is used only with regard to God. Except for one exception. To your father. That you reverence him. That you honor him. And you do that through willing, joyful obedience. Now, 
Let me just show you that you do not fear the Lord. Young person, listen to me. I'm going to show you that you may not fear the Lord like you think you do. My family and I are in no way prudes. I mean, we're not legalists. Uh, we'd probably be maybe too open for some of you. I don't know. We just Our Christian life is life. It's following Jesus Christ. But my wife has talked to me recently about, she knows how to sew, but she says, I really need to take some sewing classes. Why? Because we're not going to be able to buy anything for our daughter. She said, literally, she's two, and some of the clothes that, that are in those shops for her to put on are a disgrace. And she's two. Now, listen to me, young person. Hopefully you have a mother and father who care about the way you look. And we're not talking about dress like a Puritan. We're talking about just this, decency. In whatever culture you live in, that it's decent. How do you know it's decent? I'll give you a great way of looking at it. If your clothing is a frame for your face, it's decent. If it accentuates your face, it's decent. If you purposely put on clothing to accentuate your body, whether you're a man or a girl, if you purposely put on clothing in order to show how whatever you are, if it, your clothing is a frame for your face, it is sensual and God hates it. That's a rule. That's just a very good rule. Okay? Now, Listen to me. Your mom and dad look at something that you have bought and they tell you take it back. And you go, <laughs> now, look, you don't fear God. I'm sorry. I just, I just want to let you know you don't fear. I mean, you're going to argue with the very authority God has placed in your life over a piece of clothing? You don't fear God. I mean, they're not telling you not to marry a certain guy even though they maybe should tell you not to marry that guy. And you should listen. But you, you argue with them even over clothing or what time you're supposed to come in. Don't tell me you fear God. And you say, well, the, all the other young people. That's why Proverbs says that a companion of fools will be destroyed. And if you keep listening to all those young people you're running with rather than your father and your mother, you will be destroyed. And nobody wants that. I know you've heard this a thousand times. A young person... You will never understand how much, if your dad is just a normal dad, you'll never understand how much he loves you. I would die a thousand deaths. I would throw my body in front of a truck. I would do anything for my children. And I know I'm not just special. That's the way any normal dad would be. And if they're telling you something, it is for your good. Honor that. Praise God for that. Honor it. You young men and fathers, now come on. Don't Let me tell you something, fathers. If you're not spending a lot of time with your sons and your daughters, you are wrong. You're just wrong. But don't walk into their life today and make all kinds of promises that everything's going to change, especially if they're 16 now. Here's what you do. You spend the next year or so, just creating bindings between you and them. Building a relationship gradually. And then using that relationship to bless those children. To teach them about Christ, not through some legalistic mouth, but with a life full of the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God. Now children... You don't like that, do you? Children. You call me children. I'm 15. Yeah, but your dad's still buying your tennis shoes. So you are a child. Guys, I, young guys, I kind of hit on the girls with the clothing thing. Well, let's just try you for a second before we move on. In my day, my dad called me boy all the time. Boy, get up. Boy, it's just what everybody... <laughs> I was a boy. He called me boy. 
all right? Now, I walk up to one of you young 14-year-old football players, and I go, boy, come here. I know, boy. Well, let me ask you a question. What are you? Now, just quite, what are you? Are you a man? Do you work and, 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 and pay for your food and your rent and your insurance? Uh, what are, if you're not a boy, what are you? I'm an adolescent. Adolescent is a word devised by psychologists that has no biblical basis whatsoever. There is no such thing as adolescence. It is a lie. Because here's what you have. You go, for example, to the... Um, could be the Losi tribe of Africa. Um, any number of the tribes in Africa. Here's what you get. A boy is a boy. Until he is about 11. And he starts being drawn in with the rest of the men. And then pretty soon he is given some sort of initiation. And he steps over into manhood. He's fighting wars. He's killing lions. He's, he's building a house. He's providing for a wife. He's a man. You see, our culture, what it's done is this. You're a boy until you're about 10 or 11. And then you demand to be called an adolescent. Now, an adolescent usually lasts from about 11 to now, sometime after college. Okay? I know this is hurting. Sometime after college. And you know what adolescence is? It's a young man demanding to be able to exercise the privileges of manhood without being willing or able to assume any of those responsibilities. You see? You say, well, I want to go out with that girl. Why? Why? Are you going to marry her? The first thing I always ask them, well, if God's been working in your life to marry her, you're young. Praise God. You've been working. God, your father's been teaching you character. You've got a job now. No, I don't want to marry. I just want to go out with her. Why? I'll tell you why. Recreational dating. You want to get from her the things you should only be able to get out of a marriage. And I'm not just talking about physical relationships. I'm talking about emotional intimacy, everything. It is not biblical. That's why dating is a sin. Unless it is in the course of seeking a spouse. Now you understand why I preach in a lot of places once. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. Now, it's here to honor the fathers. So I've talked about how children ought to honor their fathers. Now I'm going to talk about how wives. Yeah, you won't be smiling long. <laughs> Listen. Sir, your headship, your headship is not to be like Caesar's. That's an authority that Jesus totally negated. Your headship is to be like Christ's. That means you have authority only so that it will enable you to bless your wife and children. It is never to use it for self, the promotion of self, or the promotion of one's own will. We have been given authority in order to lay down our lives for our wives and our children. And if you're like me, you can do a lot of things a lot better than you do that. But wives, you were created according to the Bible. Now, I know everybody hates this nowadays, but, well, they hate the gospel I preach too. You were created to be your husband's helper now, that doesn't mean you're not an individual in your own right because Jesus is going to give you a name that only he and you know, not even your husband. You're an individual in your own right. You're not an extension of your husband in that sense. But listen, I build bows and arrows and you can kill an elk with one of them, but you can't play a song on one because it wasn't made to play a song. It was made to kill something. In the same way, God made men for something. What did God make men for? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. To go out and conquer in the name of Christ. Sir, your 
when I look in your eyes, when your wife looks in your eyes, what she ought to see is a man totally given over to fulfilling the will of God in his generation. That's what you were created to do. And wife, you were created to help him and not hinder him. You were created to be wind, to be a helper, and not a ball and chain. Now, men, be very, very careful because it's very hard for a woman to submit to a man. When she looks in his eyes, she doesn't see kingdom come, thy will be done. She sees a little boy who little boy wants to buy more toys for himself or have more free time for himself. But she is to do that. And woman, listen to me. The world is lying to you. It's lying to you. In what ways? Number one, it is not a dishonor to be a wife. Number two, it is not a dishonor to be a mother. It is not a wasted life. Number three, submission does not mean inferiority because if it does, if you believe that, if you believe submission means inferiority, then you have to go join the Jehovah Witnesses because the Son of God submitted to His Father. Does that mean He's inferior to Him? Absolutely not. The husband's desire is to promote the will of God by promoting the well-being of his wife and his children spiritually and every other way. Her responsibility is to rejoice in that and try to help him. Now, the big issue, ladies, is that your husband needs to change, doesn't he? He needs to change. Boy, that guy, he needs to. That's why you married him. To fix him. He needs to change. Poor thing just standing there on the side of the road like a wet puppy. Dumb as a log and you came by and just to save him. Well, that may be true. You want, you say that you would submit to your husband and it'd be a lot more delightful if your husband was like Jesus Christ. That's true. One of your big problems is your husband isn't like Jesus Christ. At least that's my wife's biggest problem. But how does she make him like Jesus? How does she become an instrument to make him like Christ? Well, I just want to point out a few ways in Scripture. First of first of all, let's go for just a minute to first Peter. Chapter three. It says in verse one, likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it shows us that God is all wise and that the Bible is inspired. Why? What we're going to see. First of all, I want you to look at wife. If you want to honor your husband, especially on dad's day and from now on, you must rely upon the quality of your life and not argumentation. Now, look here at verse one. Likewise, ye wives. Now, the reason why it says likewise is because he's connecting this verse with the verses that precede it. And what are the verses that precede it? Christian suffering persecution. So he's saying, woman, even if you feel like you're suffering persecution, likewise do this. It says, in subjection to your own husbands. Now, if I get mad and I've had a terrible day at the office and I come home, And boy, I come in, the house is a mess, there's not much food, there's not anything, and I'm just cranky as I can be, and I'm like, why didn't you do this, and what is that? If my wife turns around at me and just starts in on me, man, the fight's on. And I'm justified in everything I'm doing. The fight is on. She's turned around. She's got in my face. I'm in her face. We're arguing about why aren't things the way they ought to be and this and that and everything else. And it turns into a fight and I feel justified. But if I walk in with that same sinful attitude into my home because I've had a bad day, things have gone terrible at the mission, everything else, and I walk in and I say, where's the supper? Where's this? Why is this out of order? What's going on? What have you been doing all day? All wrong questions said the wrong way already assuming sin when you're not supposed to do that. And my wife turns around, looks at me and says, 
Honey, I, I'm so sorry. It, we had a lot of calls today. There's a sister really struggling in church. So and my little boy, you know, Rowan's got the Rowan, our daughter's got the flu and this and that. And I just had to put things off because there are, there are greater priorities going on here. She turns around with that godly, submissive attitude. And you know what I do? I just go. I'll be back. I go outside and I got like a two before made out of oak behind the shed and I just grab it and I just beat myself in the head. It's like she has poured heaping hot coals on my head with her godly submissiveness. She has extinguished my fire. She has shamed me by her obedience, by her following of Christ, even though her husband is acting like a jerk. Her following of Christ has totally disarmed me and shamed me. But if she fires back with the same sinful attitude, then the only thing that's going to happen is the battle continues. Do you see that? Now, another thing, look at this. This is so important. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be one by conversation of the wives. You say, well, how can they be one without the word and by a conversation? Conversation in the old English refers to lifestyle. Lifestyle. Now, look what he's saying. You, you don't think God knows women? He said, so that you can win your husband without a word. Because how do you always try to change your husband? How do you try to change? Come on. <laughs> Can I get a witness? And not just from the brother over here shaking his wife. <laughs> Is How do you seek to change your husband? You seek to do it with the word, with the tongue. Is that not true? I mean, bam! And you know what? You're better at it than he is. And you're always going to back him into a corner. You are. He says, you're never going to, be, you're never going to change your husband that way. You're going to fill him full of resentment, bitterness, and everything else. But if you will attack the problem, but with a godly lifestyle instead of your tongue, you will win the day. Now, let me give you just a quick illustration. I love castles. Go over Europe. When I'm not preaching, I'm going to hunt down a castle. I just love castles. Something really strange about castles. The front door on castles is huge. They're huge. Thirty men riding horses could come in that front door on the first level. Here's the unusual thing. In most of those castles, to get up on the second floor, the stairwell is only this wide. And the door at the top of it is only about this high and about this wide. It's like, why? The guy showed me. He said, because if, if you know that an evading army is coming and they're knocking down that front huge castle door, that gate, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's a thousand of them and there's 50 of you. Everybody runs up to the second floor. Well, why? Because that army, no matter how large it is, they can only make it up that stairwell one at a time. They can't batter down the door. There's not enough room. And one man standing there with a lance can guard the entire castle from a thousand soldiers. Pretty smart, huh? Woman, I just described your relationship with your husband. The king is sitting on his throne and he has really messed up. So you have surrounded his castle and you are knocking down the front gate. And he knows I'm getting out of here. So he runs up to the top. And what does he do? He's standing there. And you march up that stairway after him. You're going to get him. You're going to lash him. You're going to change him. You're going to tell him. You're going to correct him. Now, there's a passage in the book of Romans, chapter 12, that says, give place to the wrath of God. I want you to think about this, lady. You march up that stairwell after him, and you're fighting him with everything you got. Does he change? Has he ever changed by you doing that? Come on, never, never. Because he's just standing there like this. 
And the whole time you're fighting against him, you're going, God, help me, help me. You're praying. You're praying like crazy. You got all the women in the church praying against your husband. Another way in which you're dishonoring your husband is you're sharing gossip with all the other women about how bad he is. That's why sometimes women's groups need to be monitored by a very godly woman. You don't like me anymore, do you? You liked it when I was getting your husband last night. But you're sitting there and you're fighting with your husband and you're going, God, help me. God, why don't you help me? I don't understand why you don't help me. Why don't you help me? Get out of the way. Why don't you help me? Give place to the wrath of God. Why don't you help? Get out of the way. And I will deal with your husband. But as long as you keep doing what you're doing and not giving place to the wrath of God, you can fight all your life, sister, if that's what you want. Now, guys... If you go home today and you act like a jerk and your wife treats you with the sweetness of Christ himself, you get ready. God, that woman wants you dead. She knows she's going to get out of the way. She's going to, God, kill him. So when she starts being nice to you, realize she, she, she wants you gone. No, but do this, man. If your wife starts acting like Christ and instead of fighting against you, loves you, prays for you, and honors you, you better be afraid. I've never known a case where God didn't intervene and deal with that man. Now, he says this, just really quick, because we've got to go. When you want your husband to change on this wonderful day of the dad, do not sharply rebuke him. There's a principle it's not dealing necessarily with wives and husbands, but it's dealing with authorities in the church. First Timothy 5, that you are not to sharply rebuke an elder, someone in authority. You are to appeal to him. In the same way, wife, you are not to sharply rebuke, but you are to appeal to your husband. Appeal to him. Also, 5.33 of Ephesians says, the wife must see that she respects, honors, reveres her husband. Fears her husband in a way that we are to fear God. Also, look again in First Peter verse, chapter 3, verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Demonstrating a submissiveness. A submissive spirit as the handmaiden of the Lord. And I want to tell you something. If that husband of yours is a little boy who just thinks about himself and things and his own life and his own hobbies and everything else, you keep walking with Christ. Christ will deal with him. Let me share with you something that's very important. Never forget, gentlemen, that we are married to the daughters of God. Now, let's say a man worked for me. And he just after a year didn't produce anything. He's young. I'm going to keep him on. I'm going to help him out. Try to get him to work better. Maybe help teach the kids something. But let's say that there is a man who works for me. And 95% of all our income comes from that man. He's valuable. No way I'm going to lose him. But he happens also to be married to my daughter. And I find out he's been very abusive to my daughter. I don't care. It's not going to help him one bit that he is very profitable to my company. He's been abusive to my daughter. He is going to pay the penalty for it. Now, I want you to think about something. You are married to God's daughter. He doesn't call her a daughter just metaphorically. We're not just children of God poetically. We really are children of God. She really is God's daughter. You need to be afraid because... Even though I do not believe in violence and all the other things, I would do anything to defend my daughter. Anything. Tremble, man. Tremble. Another thing, as I shared last night, if you want your daughter to marry a louse, then you act like one. Because she's not going to have a standard much higher than her dad. So we have, listen, you know what just breaks my heart? The Word of God 
is filled with so many wonderful truths that if we had just apply them to our life, how much different it would be. And as someone has said over and over, and I say it with them, the church is messed up because families are messed up. Families are messed up. You know, if you're biblical in the church and not biblical in the family, what's that going to get you? Because you're more time with your family than you are in the church. I would encourage the fathers to really start studying the Word of God and ask themselves, what does the Bible say about being a father, about being a husband, and walk in submission to that. I would ask the young men to stop being boys. To start... Listen, my goal in life is that by the time my boys are 17... They could marry. That doesn't mean they will. That doesn't mean, but that is my goal. I do not want to have a 20 year old who gets all giggly because some new video game has come out. I want him to think about fighting dragons and conquering kingdoms and doing all these things in the name of Christ. About loving a woman. Raising up a godly heritage unto the Lord. Those types of things. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would just use this time. That you would help your people. In Jesus' name.